Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our third panel session of the Greenlight Climate Festival. Uh, this session will explore climate action in New York City and highlight some of the incredible leaders that are making New York a greener, cleaner, and better place to live. Uh, for this session, I am joined by our esteemed guests, Kara uh, Allen, who I believe will be joining us momentarily, uh, who is a senior advisor for policy regulatory affairs at NYSERDA. We also have Adrian Benepe, who is a former Parks Commissioner and uh, the current president of Brooklyn, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yes, Brooklyn Botanic Garden. Uh, we also have Courtney Worrell, who is the president and CEO of the Waterfront Alliance. And then we also have Prajal Duga, who is the director of sustainability initiatives for the MTA. Uh, so as you can all see, all of our attendees can see, we have um, some incredible leaders across a broad spectrum of industries within New York City, and we'll have a lot of really cool and interesting perspectives as we explore this conversation. Uh, so I guess first, I'd just like to ask each of you to kind of introduce yourselves, talk a little bit about your work and how it fits into the sustainability, into the climate action ecosystem of New York and New York City. Um, and maybe we can start with you, Courtney. All right, great. Hi, everybody. My name is Courtney Worrell. I lead the Waterfront Alliance. So I'll tell you a little bit about the Waterfront Alliance and how we got started for some context. So the Waterfront Alliance was originally not a nonprofit. We were a project of the Municipal Arts Society. So I don't know if you all are familiar with Municipal Arts Society. They're one of the premier organizations within New York City that works on historic preservation. They had a lot to do with the preservation of Grand Central. Uh, so waterfront, the waterfront of New York City and New Jersey was recognized in the mid 2000s as a thing that was changing and going to change in ways that either would be good or bad or neutral, but if it wasn't planned and if there wasn't a, a way of looking at that change, we would be in trouble. And the reason for that change was that we were an industrial, uh, an industrial center for, for decades, if not a century. That industrial change that happened across the country happened here. And we transitioned from an industrial waterfront to a post-industrial waterfront and then transitioning from post-industrial to what we now call a world-class waterfront. So as the Municipal Arts Society looked at this more deeply, they realized this actually was so big, it needed its own nonprofit. So we were spun off and created as a new nonprofit in 2008. So we're relatively new to the scene, considering the longevity of many of the organizations that are here today and others in the city. And what we've worked on since that time is revitalizing the New York City and New Jersey waterfront. So that's the 700 plus linear miles of waterfront and coastline that makes up the five boroughs and New Jersey from Sandy Hook, New Jersey to the New York border. So the areas of focus that we've had are one thing, education. So reconnecting people to the idea that this is a city and a region of water surrounded by water. Uh, does everybody know the only New York City borough that's not an island? or on an island, Adrian knows, um, it's the Bronx. <laughs> so my hometown, the Bronx, is the only one that's connected to the landmass of the United States. If that tells you how much coastline we have. And so what we, so the education of just reorienting people to this wonderful asset that we have that was no longer dirty, thanks to the Clean Water Act, uh, was accessible in many places. And then also working on all the advocacy that's needed for the ecology of the waterfront. So um, as we all know, waterfronts are very popular for luxury condominiums. People want to go to the water, but the other things that want to go to the water are organisms and animals and aquatic life. The edge of the edge where water meets land is some of the most ecologically productive places on earth. And so we have to manage all of that development and desire for the water, both for humans and for ecology. So that was another big focus of our work. And then also it get, comes down to planning. What kind of public access are we gonna have? What kind of projects are gonna be built on the waterfront? As climate change became much more apparent as a threat and more and more people who were in leadership positions realized that we were on a trajectory where sea level rise was not going to change. That's when the Waterfront Alliance adopted a major strategy for climate change resiliency. So I can talk a little bit more about that and I'm sure that'll be a focus of this conversation, but just a couple highlights. 
We started um, three years ago with the launch of the Rise to Resilience Coalition. This is a coalition of organizations across New York City and New Jersey that are working together to make sure that the laws and regulations and rules and planning that we do on the waterfront and also inland reflect the changes that are gonna come because of climate change. So I can tell you more about how to get involved with that. And then the other part of the work that we've done is a major public education program related to climate resiliency. And that's making sure that the next generation of children, the next generation of students and current teachers and parents know what it means to be climate literate. And the other thing we do is we try to steer private development to make sure that private developers are incentivized to create the most ecological designs on the waterfront and that those designs allow for people to reach the water because we love the water so much. So I'll leave it at that, but that's the summary of us. Great, thank you so much, Courtney. No, that's a really great insight. And also I think that that demonstrates the really salient point that we often overlook water just because we're you know land-based creatures, but uh, yeah, water is really important in this conversation and our waterfronts, of course. Um, maybe next we could have uh, Projel to talk a little bit about uh, your work at the MTA. I'm sorry, Pujol, you're on uh, mute. That's the nature of Zoom. That's right. And it, all, it's, uh... it's the it's the uh, the phrase of our times. Uh, firstly, I'm I think I might be the only one uh, doing this on a phone, so I'm in a landscape or portrait format. Is that all right? Um, sure. Okay. Great. So my name is Pujol Datta. I am the Director of Sustainability Initiatives at uh, the New York MTA. Uh, the New York MTA, as you all know very well, is um, a composite of uh, New York City Transit, uh, the subways and buses, but also Long Island Railroad, Metro North, uh, Construction and Development, um, which used to be the Capital Construction Company, uh, and the Business Services Center. So it's a, it's a, a large group, we're almost, um, 70,000 people. I work for the headquarters in a sort of umbrella function and um, and sort of the federal uh, monies, the state monies flow through us. And that gives us a little bit of an ability, although the headquarters does not run a single train or a bus, but it gives us a small ability to influence um, some of the outcomes. And this is where sustainability sits within the organization. Now, even before uh, there was a MTA sustainability, uh, even before anything else, the, the single biggest fact is thanks to public transportation and the lifestyles and the transportation choices it enables and engenders, um, New York is incredibly, so the state of New York is uh, 50 out of 50 at the bottom in terms of per capita and per household greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the five boroughs of New York City, um, if you could, uh, basically, you know, if you fudge the math very slightly, it basically is already at the target of the Kyoto Protocol. So if we all have to cut uh, our emissions down, so if all Americans have to reduce their emissions by three quarters and reach roughly one quarter of what their current emissions or their emissions baseline at 2000 or wherever you want to baseline 2005, the the 9 million residents of New York City already sit at that target. They're already one quarter, uh, between a third and a quarter uh, in terms of emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions per capita for the rest of the country. So basically, if you could wave a magic wand and propagate the MTA all over the United States, then we would, we would have reached all our climate goals. That is how key public transportation is uh, to this problem. And uh, it has not been well understood. And even when it has been understood, it's kind of, there's been, uh, you know, various dispensations of, in terms of a federal government um, that has kind of not like, so public transportation has an image problem in the United States because um, right after the Interstate Highway Act, there was a great deal of, um, you know, the future was all about highways, cars, freeways, if you've seen who framed Roger Rabbit, sort of the old order was um, this uh, streetcar system and the new order was these miles and miles of freeways. Uh, and then of course, and, and that's actually a great movie. Um, and that's basically where we are today is that Americans drive and uh, not only is it bad for the planetary health, it's also terrible for their own health. Uh, Americans take 2,500 steps uh, per day on average. 
um, whereas the recommended level is 10,000. New Yorkers do about 12,000, 12,500 steps a day. Now, this is all pre-pandemic data. Um, surely some of this has changed and some of this is probably an elastic deformation that will go back to being where we were, but some of this is probably a plastic deformation that will not go back uh, to where it is. So the bottom line is public transportation is a friend uh, of climate and of uh, keeping um, greenhouse gas emissions down. We emit about 2 million metric tons a year and not in 2020, but most other years, our avoidance, which is what we keep out of the environment is about eight and a quarter times. So we keep about 17 million metric tons of greenhouse gases out of the environment. And um, if we can make the systems uh, easier for riders, uh, perhaps less expensive for the riders, um, we would attract greater ridership. If we can do capital expansion, um, bring transit to transit deserts, um, and all of this is a very slow process, uh, but all of this would add up to one of the best, if not the best way to fight climate change, uh, more than renewable energy generation, more than uh, vehicle electrification, uh, in my opinion and my analysis. But I also have an inward facing role. So this is everything I spoke about is to make the case for public transportation outwardly, but I also have an inward facing role, which is to make our own operations greener. And that can happen in various ways. So for instance, one of the things I'm working on is we have plenty of parking lots and large industrial sized roofs, um, often in very, very good zip codes where there is um, sort of a shortage of electricity. And now with uh, solar power being, um, you know, at cash flow positive levels, whereas basically it's not something that you have to do out of the goodness of your heart, but it will actually make you money to try to get all of our, we don't have a lot of capital funds, nor do you imagine somebody like the MTA uh, to be spending money on putting uh, solar panels on roofs, but we can do a public-private partnership uh, and do that in that way. Energy storage is another biggie. If we are going to go all renewable, then we will have to smoothen out the valleys and the peaks. Uh, there again, we are connected. We virtually own our own grid, um, which is the third rail power grid. Um, and it's very easy for us to uh, come up with solutions where we can store or again, working with the private sector so that the capital cost comes from somewhere else. Um, and then finally, uh, I'm also in the middle of um, our whole MTAs and I'm uh, helping, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, the headquarters and agency functions are a little bit different, but I'm working with my colleagues at New York City Transit Department of Buses uh, to do in this bus electrification program to find synergies. For instance, um, our third rail power is all DC. Can we use our third rail grid to charge buses? because otherwise the buses are, have, the batteries are DC, you get the power in AC, you then use inverters to, um, to rectify it, bring it to DC and, and charge the buses. There are heat losses, but we have some, um, some unique uh, ways to sort of uh, opportunities. So to explore those opportunities and to think a little bit outside the box, uh, that's the kind of work I do. Uh, you can find it on mta.info slash sustainability. That's really fantastic. Um, and we'll definitely include that link uh, in the chat and in the conference space so people can access it. But um, to touch, I guess, to give the energy perspective, because I know, you know, I know you just mentioned it. And as as we all know, energy kind of drives the economy. Um, maybe we could have Kara uh, talk a little bit about her work and, you know, how NYSERDA is is fighting climate change in New York. Sure. Thank you, Elliot. And thank you all for having me. So uh, NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, has, has its hands in several various um, activities that I, I'll speak to uh, on the energy side um, and really on the climate side, actually, on, on both fronts. Um, and really what I'm going to point to is the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which was signed by Governor Cuomo in July of 2019 and sets some of the most ambitious targets for climate um, change action as well as clean energy. Uh, not only in the US, but also globally. And uh, Perjol knows this well as uh, one of the folks who has been working with us to implement the act and its various provisions, which um, are wide sweeping and not only include climate leadership, but as the title says, also include community protection and most notably looking out for New York's most vulnerable communities and citizens. There is a uh, provision 
that focuses on, and we've seen this provision actually replicated at the federal level, that 40% of the benefits of our clean energy and energy efficiency investments must go toward New York's disadvantaged communities. And that is something that's being worked on by uh, the Climate Justice Working Group, which the law establishes. The law also establishes a Climate Action Council, and the Climate Action Council is helping New York to advance toward the goals that the law identifies, which includes a 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 against a 1990 baseline, uh, and also a no less than 85% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by mid-century. Uh, to help support those climate um, targets, we have a series of clean energy targets that the state has been working toward over the course of many years, and as a result of some of the great progress that we've seen to date uh, in terms of renewable energy procurement and installations, these targets have actually increased over time. Uh, so one of those targets is uh, to move from a 50% uh, renewable electricity consumption target toward a 70% renewable electricity consumption target by 2030. Again, in recognition of the great strides that we're all taking, including some of the solicitations that NYSERDA has been putting out on an annual basis since the clean energy standard uh, order was passed um, in August of 2016 and first began implemented uh, in uh, January of 2017. Uh, so again, we've increased our renewable electricity consumption targets. We're also looking to procure more energy storage, three gigawatts of energy storage by 2030. Uh, we've also increased our offshore wind goals to nine gigawatts of offshore wind by 2035. And you also saw from the federal administration this week, a goal of 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. So you can just take a moment and realize how much of New York's goal will be playing into the federal government's goal. And a lot of the work that New York has started with respect to offshore wind and the thoughtfulness that we have put into how we can cite offshore wind projects, how much of a role that that is going to be playing as other states look to do the same. Uh, and then we also have a distributed solar goal. Uh, our New York Sun program that NYSERDA has run and has run since 2012 has been very effective in increasing solar deployment across the state. So much so that we've taken uh, our target that was set for 2023, and we actually doubled it uh, for just a few short years later uh, to six gigawatts of distributed solar by 2025. So we have a lot of really great goals, a lot of ambitious goals, but uh, these are goals that um, by and large have moved over time in recognition of the progress that New York has made toward, uh, toward a clean energy future and a clean energy economy. And so these are some of the targets that are now in law and now we are required to meet. And so I mentioned the Climate Action Council earlier. There is a Climate Action Council that consists of a number of state agency heads as well as appointees from the Assembly and from the Senate and the New York State Legislature. And these uh, individuals have been appointed to the Climate Action Council, which is charged with developing an economy-wide scoping plan for how New York will meet these greenhouse gas reduction targets that I identified earlier. That work is actively underway. Uh, and any of you who are not um, uh, receiving updates on this process would certainly encourage you to sign up for them. You can sign up at climate.ny.gov at the top of the website. You'll actually see a, a link to say sign up for updates. It has been a very active process. As I said, this is focused economy-wide, not just on the energy sector. Some of the state's prior work had focused on the energy sector, which in sum and total does account for all of our greenhouse gas emissions. When I say energy, I'm really focused on combustion-based resources. So it comprises over 80% of New York's overall economy when I talk about focusing on combustion. Um, but again, a lot of this is also shifting um, as a result of the Climate Act's provisions that require new accounting methodology for our greenhouse gas emissions. So New York is moving toward a new accounting um, for our greenhouse gas emissions to look at 20-year global warming potential as opposed to 100-year global warming potential. That's um, the 100-year GWP is how most accounting is done on an international basis, but the law specifies that we need to be looking toward the 20-year global warming potential of various greenhouse gas emissions. It also specifies that New York should be accounting for upstream fossil fuel emissions. And so from production to extraction to consumption, we need to be looking at the full life cycle of fossil fuels in New York State. So that all is ongoing right now. We'll actually be producing an updated accounting. Uh, the law requires uh, no later than January 1 of next year. So our colleagues at the Department of Environmental Conservation are actively working on that now. And again, encourage all of you to follow that process as this is 
uh, new and will provide us with um, more information and more um, discussion to be had on exactly how New York will achieve these targets that the law specifies. So all of this, various uh, these various efforts um, are coming together under the, uh, under the CLCPA and the Climate Action Council will be taking this into account as they develop this economy-wide plan. Right now, helping the Climate Action Council to develop that plan are a series of advisory panels. And so there's one focused on transportation. There is one focused on waste. There's one focused uh, by and large on industry, um, one focused on power generation, another focused on energy efficiency and housing, another focused on, um, oh goodness, who am I missing in my long list? Uh, there's a just transition working group, which is the only one that is not focused on mitigation strategies, but more on an economy-wide, um, uh, also focused economy-wide agriculture and forestry, and then uh, land use and local government. So again, very much taking the economy, breaking it up into sectors, working with teams of experts, um, including fellow agencies, including nonprofits, including academics, um, including industry, including businesses, uh, clean energy developers, taking all of the great expertise that New York has, bringing them together under these panels to create recommendations for the Climate Action Council to consider in thinking about how we are going to proceed with reaching these targets. So this process is, is going on in real time. There is actually going to be a Climate Action Council meeting coming up on Monday, April 12th, uh, where some of these recommendations will be discussed with the Climate Action Council by the advisory panel chairs. So would encourage all of you again, please tune in. Active, ongoing uh, process, and we wanna make sure that the public um, is engaged because this is talking about New York's future. And that's certainly the topic of today's panel. So again, I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here to tell you about all of the exciting work that is happening now in real time, but is designed to look ahead and ensure that New York has a bright and sustainable future. So I will leave it at that. Yeah, thank you so much, Kara. Um, really excellent. And I think that's also a really nice segue. You know, you, you mentioned all of these different elements have to come together in order to address uh, climate change. Um, and I think the last point you made was about uh, land use and public lands. Uh, so I think with that, we'll, we'll turn it over to uh, Adrian, who could tell us a little bit about his work at Brooklyn Botanical Garden. I'm sorry, Brooklyn Botanic Garden. I know I've made that mistake before. Um, and just, I guess, give us an overview of, you know, the really exciting work you're doing, preserving green spaces and making New York a healthier, uh, a healthier place to live. Um, thanks, Elliot. Um, great to be with this really distinguished panel. We're sitting here at the, God, these people are really smart. They all three spoke with no notes for 10 minutes. So see if I can um, see them, probably not raise them. Um, great to be on this panel. This is fascinating. I learn things all the time and um, have had interactions, certainly with Courtney. I used to be on the board of the Waterfront Alliance. Um, I miss being on that board. And I have my own board to sort of help run the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. You know, just a little bit of background on me. I've been involved with the public sector, the nonprofit sector, in some way, shape, or form, involved with public space in the public realm for 42 years now. <laughs> a little bit more than that, 43 years. Um, so you know, I've, I've been working in that realm all that time, these last four decades. Just in the last six months here at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, but prior to that, for eight years, I was a trust for public land overseeing our national sort of urban park agenda, in particular our Kemenawa campaign, campaign aimed at getting every resident of every American city and town within the Kemenawa Park, or actually getting a park within the Kemenawa Park, those people, because uh, moving those people is harder than creating the parks. <clears throat> um, prior to that, I was the New York City Parks Commissioner for 11 of the 12 years of the Bloomberg, Michael Bloomberg administration. Before that, I was the Manhattan Parks Commissioner under Mayor Giuliani and a number of jobs uh, at parks going back actually to the Abe Beam years, but really starting under Mayor Koch and then Parks Commissioner Gordon Davis. So a long career in parks and open space. You know, I think what's changed in those 40 years, and there's been a significant change, is the perceptions <clears throat> and the realities. There's always been the reality of parks are much more than some of the parts, they're much more than just these pleasant little things at the end of the street. Um, we have a much greater understanding now <coughs> excuse me, of the truly vital role that parks and open space play, open spaces play in cities, 
in towns in the nation at large. Um, you know, this is preaching to an audience of the converted, but you have a large audience out there. So it's worth rehashing, you know, what are those uh, extraordinary values that folks have? <clears throat> uh, you know, just <clears throat> put something out, just as a blanket statement, you can't have a livable city without parks and open space. And not just because they're pleasant and they make you feel good, those are important things and they're pretty and you get to get exercise in them, but you don't have a, <clears throat> a physically healthy city without parks and open space. Uh, parks open space are key to good physical and mental health. If you think about that just for a second, um, think about what's happened during the lockdown and the pandemic here in New York City. Everything else shut down. Thank goodness the governor of New York and the mayor of New York in their infinite wisdom, and this was really quite wise, kept the parks open. Other cities and counties and states shut their parks down. A huge mistake right across the river in New Jersey. Uh, one of the big mistakes made early on was the governor shutting down the um, state and county parks, because in many communities, that's all they have. So they're denying access to the only you know, definably safe activity that we have. And early on, public health officials, epidemiologists were telling us that really the only safe place to go to be with other people, distanced, masked, was in parks, because they understood very early on this virus, this particular virus does not transmit well outdoors. In fact, outdoors is kind of a sanitizing agent. Sunlight is a sanitizing agent. Heat is a sanitizing agent. Wind blows away the uh, sort of gasified virus. So <clears throat> um, in many communities, they were working against common sense um, because of a fear and a lack of understanding. Once, once we started to understand that, we also understood that it's the only safe place for us to go. And A, B, we desperately need this for our physical and mental health. We need to maintain of physical and mental health in the face of the um, of pandemic. Getting back to pre-pandemic, we've also come to understand quite acutely over the last couple of decades, the crucial environmental and ecological roles that the parks play, particularly in both reducing the advance of climate change and mitigating the impacts of climate change. And again, preaching to this converted audience, what do we mean by that? Uh, first and foremost, parks, green spaces, trees uh, play a, a singularly important role, which is absorbing and storing carbon. Um, I don't, there's probably some numbers about how much carbon is stored in all the trees in the United States, but it's massive amounts, massive, massive, massive amounts. Whereas if you cut down all those trees, you release all that carbon in the atmosphere, that would be a very bad thing. Um, so, um, just think about a world without forests and you have a world which is unlivable. They absorb our carbon. The, the miraculous thing that trees and plants do, and I never get over the fact that this is a truly a miracle. They absorb our waste products, the carbon that we produce from our bodies in breathing and the carbon produced by industry and by transportation. They absorb that and give us back oxygen. How, what better exchange can you have? It is a perfect exchange. Which is why when we say we need to venerate trees, we really do. Trees and plants are life-giving things in, this, in, our, in our society, in our world. Without trees and plants, there is no life. We're understanding a lot more now about the, um, the roles that urban trees play. Some scientific studies have shown that urban trees work harder than rural trees because they're dealing with so much more carbon. They have to pro process more carbon. Uh, we understand now that certain trees are much better absorbing carbon. So you want really big trees with really big leaves because the leaf surface absorbs both the carbon and they, they grab the particulate matter out of, the, out of the air pollution. Another very important role. <clears throat> they um, absorb and store this carbon. Trees are also very important in another aspect of climate change mitigation, which is the, the single biggest killer in climate change right now is not flooding. And by the way, flooding is a very important thing. It's a, it's a major risk here in New York City and in most coastal cities, even on cities that live on rivers. But um, trees play a very important role in reducing the urban heat island effect and impact. So the, the biggest killer of people right now related to climate change is heat. And it disproportionately kills people in poor communities. And disproportionately, if you look at the maps, poor communities lack tree cover and they lack access to parks. We saw this dramatically demonstrated in a way we had never seen before, the lack of equity in park access during the pandemic here in New York City. So the one thing that did get, well, a few things got shut down in New York City, 
again, a mistake in hindsight, but um, easy for us to say now. <clears throat> they, while they kept the larger parks open, um, they shut down all the, the so-called playgrounds. Now there were a thousand playgrounds in New York City. And in many cases, in many communities, places like central Brooklyn, right near the Botanic Garden, the only parks are these things called playgrounds. They're kind of large playgrounds that function as community parks. You might have a small play area, basketball courts, handball courts, a sitting area, maybe a running track or an asphalt or synthetic field. They shut all those down. We just said, oh, it's called a playground? It's dangerous, we're gonna shut that down. That denied access to a nearby park to a million and a half New Yorkers who suddenly lost access to their neighborhood parks. So all of central Brooklyn, much of Queens, much of the South Bronx, the very neighborhoods most impacted by the pandemic had the double whammy of having their, the only thing they get to do that's healthy taken away from them. It was grotesque in hindsight. Again, not deliberate, but there was no thinking that went into closing down these playgrounds. And luckily that was reversed about halfway through last summer. Um, so that role that parks play for physical and mental health and for ecological health the, the final role I'll mention in terms of climate change and resilience is um, absorption. Parks, by their very nature, for the most part, are function as sponges, whether they're natural wetlands along our, along our oceans and rivers or just porous places for stormwater to go into. One of the biggest problems in New York City in terms of water pollution is that we're largely paved over. We, we eliminated 90% of our naturally occurring wetlands. We paved everything over, we created non porous impermeable surfaces everywhere that are also, by the way, very hot. <clears throat> um, so the storm water goes into the storm sewers. The storm sewers feed into the sewage treatment plants. Every time it rains, even a little amount, they shut the gates to the sewage treatment plants because they don't want to be overwhelmed by the stormwater runoff because we have this combined sewer system here in New York City. That means all the raw sewage from your buildings, your toilets, goes straight out into the harbor every time it rains. So uh, what we really need to do is create as many opportunities as possible for the stormwater to go into the ground and into the water table instead of into a storm sewer, something we know as green infrastructure. So all over New York City, there's been an effort made to unpave, to depave, to add porous places with plants that also serve the function of storing, car storing carbon, absorbing pollutants, absorbing stormwater and cooling. So um, it's a long, long story, I could go on forever, but that's some of the, the major roles that parks and open spaces play. And in New York City, what does that mean? We have 45,000, nearly 50,000 acres of parks legally constitute parks and open spaces within the city, state, and federal parks. People forget that there's 15,000 acres in Jamaica Bay run by the National Park Service. That doesn't include other open spaces, cemeteries, campuses and universities, backyards. So um, it's really important to keep those open spaces for the vital roles they play for our overall health and for um, mitigating the impacts of climate change. Great, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for sharing, Adrian. And I think that from all of your perspectives, I know that our, our audience is definitely learning a lot and also thinking about climate action in a very new way. It's not just, I'm gonna you know, turn off my car, I'm gonna bike to work. It's, it's all these different elements. It's transportation, water, energy, open spaces. Um, and I know that people have been asking, some of the attendees have been asking how they can get involved on an individual level, you know, with their work, with their school. Um, and so before we move on, I would just encourage them to check out the virtual booths that we've made for, for everybody here, for some of these really incredible organizations. You can apply for jobs, you can learn about, more about the work that they do. Um, and of course, this will be recorded for, for people to review after. Um, just to follow up on a, on a point that you, Adrian, just said, um, <clears throat> you talked about the kind of disparate effects of climate change on cer certain communities and also in our responses to climate change, that this is often this often has climate justice implications. Now, some people might not recognize that, you know, water, transportation, energy, parks, that these all have very serious climate justice implications. I was wondering if each of you could maybe just take a minute to talk about how you incorporate this, this notion of equity into your work, um, and then, you know, how you see it moving forward within the context of, of your industry. And maybe we can, again, start with, uh, with Courtney? Sure. Well, um, one of the answers I have that it links to what Adrian was talking about is that it's really important that we look at the role of parks during extreme, extreme heat events. 
And waterfront parks tend to be a lot cooler than inland parks. And so we're gonna have on extreme heat days or extreme lengths of time when the city is very hot, people really wanting to go to the water for good reason. Um, sometimes you can get temperatures, um, especially on the beach, 10, 15 degrees lower. So what we have though in New York City is we have a lot of waterfront parks that are very small and narrow right on the water's edge, but they're surrounded by streets. So there needs to be a plan in New York City to close streets on occasion when we know that there will be overflows at waterfront park locations. And so that's one of the things that the Wa Waterfront Alliance wants to work on with the next mayor to make sure that we're, we have almost a, like a modular way of planning for the great demand that there's going to be on waterfront parks. And that in particular is really important in underserved communities, which tend to have the least accessible parks and the least developed and least um, amenitied uh, features within their parks if they have them at all on the waterfront. I'd say the, the other thing that we're working on related to equity and justice is that waterfronts in, around the world, um, but in particular in New York City, will be uh, flooded because of sea level rise and increased storm surges from intense, intense, uh, intense storms. And we have many communities on the waterfront in New York City that are underserved and uh, that are disinvested historically. We have a significant amount of NYCHA ho housing on the waterfront as well. So we have many people who are in harm's way and the programs that are available for making sure that people can remain whole or become whole after a, a major storm tend to really benefit homeowners and not renters. And they tend to also not benefit people who are receiving public housing benefits. So one of the things that we need to do nationally and also in New York City and throughout the region in New York State is make sure that we have a program for helping people after disasters that helps all people from every economic uh, every ec economic class to the top. The top is kind of taken care of, not exactly, but we really need to focus on that. So um, there's more I can say, but I'll stop right now when other people can talk. Great, thank you so much, Courtney. Um, maybe Kara, uh, you could tell us a little bit about how energy plays a role um, in climate justice, especially within the context of New York City. I know you mentioned New York Sun, and I know that um, that's a part of that effort. Uh, but I guess you, I could let you take it away. Sure, I'll talk about it on a couple of fronts and obviously this is not going to cover everything that we're doing. I'll start by saying equity is a central consideration of absolutely everything the state is doing at this time. And certainly for the work that NYSERDA is doing, but also the work that we are co-leading with our partners at the uh, Department of Environmental Conservation through the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. As I said, there's a reason community protection is in there. And uh, I mentioned the 40% goal earlier that our law really did set a, a national precedent. California has been doing work in this space, but we have certainly seen since the CLCPA passed a number of other states looking to follow on with this and then seeing the federal government doing the same. Um, so when we talk about investing to benefit these communities, this is a work, as I said, uh, in progress by our Climate Justice Working Group. The Climate Justice Working Group actually consists of representatives from environmental justice communities throughout the state. So New York City, we have three representatives from New York City, uh, and then we have three representatives from upstate urban and then upstate rural. And you know, equity, we, we do think of in, in broad terms, uh, making sure that both uh, folks in our urban centers are taken care of, but also folks in our rural areas of the state as well. So equity does have a broad lens when the state thinks about it, um, because we do need to consider the entirety of the state. Uh, so again, those representatives right now are helping us to identify what we consider to be disadvantaged communities. And when we look at the impacts of climate change, that's an absolute consideration as we think about defining who disadvantaged communities in New York actually are. So that's, like I said, an ongoing process and one that, again, if you go to that website, Elliot, to your earlier point, you can sign up for updates and see when that uh, working group is meeting. So they're helping the state figure out who those communities are. And then uh, concurrently, the state will think about what does it mean to invest to benefit these communities? What are the benefits that they should be receiving as a result of our investments? Because for far too long, communities have been overlooked. They have been um, not given a, a seat at the table to make sure that their voices are being heard. Uh, and we're seeing that now uh, as folks come 
increasingly more and more to the state and say, there are opportunities with this clean energy economy. We want to be part of them. Um, so another thing that the state has been doing and through our renewable energy solicitations, uh, we look to see that uh, developers are investing locally in communities, that they are uh, looking to, um, to, uh, to local workforce opportunities. Um, again, offshore wind is a tremendous opportunity in the state. We wanna make sure uh, that we have workers ready, but workers also who have opportunity. So we need to marry the training with actual opportunities and offshore wind is a tremendous way that we're doing it. Um, I think folks may be aware of the work that's happening in Sunset Park right now around offshore wind. Uh, NYSERDA has worked with a number of communities in that area to see to it that the offshore wind work that will be carried forward uh, at the marine terminal is done with those communities in mind and to their benefit. Uh, another um, way that we think about um, equity and uh, as I said, the Climate Action Council process is ongoing. The Climate Justice Working Group that I mentioned earlier will consult with the Climate Action Council throughout this process. And so those nine reps that I mentioned earlier, as well as the four state agencies that participate as part of that working group will be part of the Climate Action Council's scoping plan process. They will make sure that climate justice is being considered, is being addressed, is being thought through as the state puts together its recommendations for how to mitigate the impacts of climate change. So that's another mechanism that we have to ensure that equity is being addressed and it is being addressed in a forward-looking way. I mentioned the advisory panels earlier. All of the advisory panels are also being charged to think about climate justice. And I can tell you right now as an example, one of those advisory panels the power generation panel is keeping central the idea of the state's goal, the Public Service Commission goal, that energy burden should be no more than 6% of, um, of a low income consumer's bill. And so, you know, making sure that as we're thinking about how we're shifting the grid, as we're building out new infrastructure, that this is not becoming an increasing burden on those who are remaining on the system. And we're talking about solar projects, we're talking about a lot of opportunities for more distributed resources. Like I said, like solar uh, is, a, is a really good example, but you don't wanna leave folks behind who are still using the current infrastructure of the grid. And so again, that is still a central consideration that working group has made abundantly clear that we have to have a reliable system, but it also has to be affordable. And we can't afford to make people, um, to put people in a position uh, just because they're not um, able to move ahead perhaps with, um, with distributed energy resources. But as you mentioned, Elliot, we have a New York Sun program. Uh, through New York Sun, uh, we do provide incentives for solar uh, projects, um, but we also look to ensure people participate as communities in solar projects. So for a lot of us in New York City, we can't put solar on our roof uh, for a variety of reasons. And so we can actually subscribe to a solar project and we can make sure that the benefits of solar are coming to people who otherwise may not be in the position to take on a solar project. Another way, and this is the final um, item that I'll point to um, when, I, when I speak about equity and some of the programs that NYSERDA is focused on, um, I mentioned workforce earlier. There are going to be a multitude of opportunities that come forward as part of this clean energy economy. Actually, right now, New York's clean energy industry, the majority of our jobs, about 110,000 of them, um, are in energy efficiency. And so we, we know that that is only gonna increase because where New York City's emissions lie are in our buildings. And so as we think about opportunities to decarbonize, we know we're gonna, we're gonna need to retrofit our existing building stock. And so that will provide New Yorkers with abundance of opportunity. So how do we prepare people for those opportunities? Uh, we have increasingly focused broadly on workforce development, not just training, but really making sure that we are prepared to seize this clean energy economy from start to finish, that we're focusing on priority populations, including disadvantaged communities. And I'm excited to share that last week, NYSERDA was actually awarded a first of its kind award from the Department of Treasury, uh, a social impact award to, uh, to develop workforce um, opportunities for people who uh, are in disadvantaged communities, people who are unemployed. Um, so looking again at a lot of these populations that um, should, be, should be seizing this opportunity that we want to um, have seize these opportunities and take advantage of all that the clean energy economy will provide. Great, thank you so much, Kara. I, I know that we're running short on time, but I was hoping we could also just get 
uh, Prajal and Adrian's thoughts on this issue, uh, you know, this notion of climate justice within the context of, of the work that you do in transportation. And then uh, we'll also go over to Adrian in the, in the land use and public land space. But maybe Prajal, you can take it away. Sure, thanks. Um, I will try to be as, as quick as I can. I just want to preface by saying that I'm uh, a part of the federal government's GSA, um, the General Services Administration has a green building, high performance green building advisory council. I just rotated off being the chair on that, but continue to be chair of one of its working groups, which is focused uh, on, um, on social justice and equity. And I think the green and sustainable industry in general, every aspect, everything that we do, um, does suffer from an image problem when it comes to EJ, because I think we are seen as this bobo, this bohemian bourgeois kind of a confluence, which it really isn't. Uh, in the field of transportation, public transportation especially, uh, I know that um, you know the, the, the data is now out. You guys have read the various stories in the newspapers. We provided the backbone for transportation uh, in the city and the metropolitan area. Um, when nothing else, you know, the, the people that had cars or had access to cars could migrate to cars. Uh, the people that lived within walking distance of their uh, places of work or wherever they had to go could do that. But for the poor people, there was no such option. The only option was the MTA, was New York City Transit, uh, etc. And as a consequence, even though ridership is still hovering between a third and a half of kind of the equivalent year um, from last year, uh, in uh, areas uh, in the South Bronx, in, in Uptown Manhattan, in Harlem, uh, in many other places in the poorer parts of the city, ridership is at two thirds or even higher. Uh, and that's because the, it is the, the poorer people that have no option but public transportation. So we are very, very closely, we're joined at the hip with uh, environmental justice uh, and environmental justice issues. Uh, I think we have to, however, do a better case of presenting our work uh, through the lens of environmental justice so as not to be seen to be, uh, you know, solar or wind or renewables uh, or a low carbon economy is not something that is fancy, is not something that should be seen with that go-go lens, I think. Uh, and that, I think, is, is something we have to work much harder toward to include everyone um, and to be seen to be including everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bajal. Uh, maybe Adrian, you can uh, kind of close us up just to talk a little bit about climate justice within the context of parks. Yeah, so I think you know, in big cities like New York that are pretty well built out. There aren't large tracts of empty land waiting to be created as parks, particularly in dense, densely populated communities like central Brooklyn. However, there are three pathways to adding more parks and even small parks are, are important um, and we just have to be more educated about you know, keep them open during a pandemic because we need them. So on the, on the biggest scale, there are opportunities to create a few large new parks, believe it or not, and particularly focusing on uh, areas that need more equity that have been uh, historically underserved. <clears throat> so along the Harlem River, on the Bronx side of Harlem River, there's an entire waterfront that could be converted into parklands. Um, there is um, along the North Shore of Staten Island, the down the African American immigrant community, you can have a whole North Shore Greenway along the North Shore of Staten Island. Um, in this, in the uh, sort of mid, sort of mid Bronx, there's a buried stream called Tibbetts Brook, which feeds into a sewer system. It's craziness. It could be daylighted and connect Van Cortlandt Park with a greenway and an open waterway to the Harlem River. And then the, the Piesta de Resistance, in my view, is the 50 acres that comprise the abandoned railway line that runs through Central Queens that we that we have to trust for public land. When I was there and re-envisioned as the Queensway. It could be a three and a half mile linear park and greenway. It's sitting city owned, growing trees, and uh, it's being prevented by lack of vision, frankly, and nimbyism. So opportunities like that need to be grabbed. The second opportunity is converting asphalt schoolyards into green playgrounds that serve the community after school, that absorb stormwater, that cool and offer places to run around and get fitness and mental health. That's something the Trust for Public Land did and has done 210 times since it started 20 years ago. There's still 700 playgrounds yet to go that can be converted to public parks. And finally, you know, maintain, preserve, and expand the community garden system. 
not only are these small green spaces that are providing environmental services, they're places to grow food, they're places to have community, and each one serves as a mini oasis providing those same array of ecosystem services as habitat, as stormwater capture, as oxygen production and carbon capture. So the city uh, should not be resting on swirls. Yes, we did a lot of good work expanding the park system. Still a lot of work to go and it's kind of stalled in terms of adding new parkland. And there's, um, you know, it's relatively low cost compared to many other big infrastructure initiatives with the big infrastructure bill coming up. A shame on us if we don't grab big chunks of that, like during the WP. The last big period of park expansion was with a work relief program, <laughs> an infrastructure program in the 1930s when Riverside Park and Marine Park and East River Park were all created and all the beaches and swimming pools. Let's use this big uh, um, infrastructure bill coming up to build the, the third next great generation of parks for New York City. Thank you so much. That's that's all this advice from all of you and demonstrating you know your leadership in this space i think it's very inspiring and i know that it's definitely helpful for me i know i learned a lot even as somebody who has a little bit of experience in the space um and i know that all, all the students who are on this call i encourage you to uh, reach out to go visit the virtual booths check out these different organizations that are fighting climate change as as you all can see and i think kara made this point earlier but there's, there's limitless opportunities for people to get involved. You don't have to be an environmental scientist. You don't have to be necessarily an engineer. Um, there's, there's a place in this movement for absolutely everyone. So okay. with that, I'm sorry, oh, yes, Courtney? I'm so sorry. Let me just say two sentences about that. I, the one message we always wanna leave people with is that the most important thing you can do is vote. What makes possible everything that Cara just talked about and so much is because there's political will. The political will comes through your, your engagement with the political process. So, uh, and we've got lots about the next mayor of New York City on the Waterfront Alliance website. So check it out and vote. I was about to say, there's been a few questions in the chat at people asking, you know, what they can do to get involved. And I think Courtney said it perfectly, you know, that it's, it's, it's voting, but I think also it's comprehensive, right? It's it's not just holding our elected officials accountable, but it's also um, thinking about how are we consuming, how are we working. Um, it's all of these different elements, and uh, a comprehensive solution and a just solution is the only one um, where we can kind of check all these boxes. Um, I know we are out of time, so I just want to quickly say thank you so much to all of our phenomenal panelists. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time out to speak with us. And for those of you who would like to learn more, please check out their organization's profiles in the virtual space, go to their websites, um, get involved yourself. And thank you all so much. Thank you, pleasure. Thanks everyone. Bye -bye. Thank okay. you. Take care everyone. Bye-bye.